Arcturus, a huge red star. It's just bursting from inside out. The red sea of plasma on its surface rages and pulsates. The star burns anything that comes close to it. And now, flop, Arcturus is gone. But at the same moment, it reappears at the center of our solar system, replacing the sun. What we see in the sky isn't a small yellow dot anymore, but a giant red ball. It's 25 times wider and 30% heavier than the sun. Even though Arcturus is a little cooler, it's still a total nightmare for Earth. The distance from our planet to the star is now 25 times less. All the water in the oceans and rivers begins to evaporate. What used to be rainforests are quickly turning into a lifeless desert. But sunsets and sunrises now look amazing. Imagine yourself on the roof of the Empire State Building, watching the sunrise. First, you see the light over the horizon. It almost blinds you, because Arcturus is 110 times brighter than the sun. Then, the star gradually climbs over the surface. The thick dot on the horizon gets wider and wider. It continues to grow, until the red star is everything you can see. Arcturus is now so close that you can even see storms of hot plasma on its surface. There are periodic outbursts and mass ejections. Huge amounts of matter are ejected from the surface of the star at speeds of up to 1,200 miles per second. The matter takes the form of a loop attached to the star at both ends. And you have to wear a super advanced spacesuit to be able to observe such a sunrise. Life on Earth ceased to exist long ago under these conditions, and it's going to get worse over time, because every eight days, Arcturus's brilliance increases, and soon, our planet will become more like Venus. It's so close to the Sun that the high temperature makes any life there impossible. Okay, let's let our planet cool down a bit and put Proxima Centauri in the center of our solar system. It's not a red giant, but a red dwarf. This star is almost seven times smaller than the Sun and almost nine times lighter. Now our oceans and rivers are not evaporating, but freezing over. Forests and jungles are covered with snow. In about a week, there won't be a single place on Earth where the temperature is above freezing. Even plants that are used to the cold will cease to exist. They mostly feed on the sun's energy. Now, they begin to starve. But there will still be water deep beneath the ice layer. It'll be heated by the hot core of our planet. Microorganisms will still be able to survive. It's much darker on Earth, too. It's like an endless twilight here. Oh, and we can barely see the moon. The thing is, it doesn't produce its own light, but reflects it from the bright sun. With Proxima Centauri instead, the moon will lose its brightness. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. But an even bigger problem would be with our orbit. The sun has a certain gravitational force, and it keeps us just in the sweet habitable zone, where we're not too hot and not too cold. Proxima Centauri's gravity is much weaker, and Earth is slowly drifting away from the star. We now run the risk of encountering asteroids flying through space, or even other planets. But the worst case scenario is if Proxima Centauri simply can't hold our planet, and we fly away into dark space. Then, you can forget about any forms of life here. Now, let's put Sirius at the center of our solar system. It's the brightest star in our night sky. It's only 70% bigger than the sun, but almost twice as hot. So its glow is not only bright, it's sizzling. And its light is not yellow, but somewhere between blue and white. You couldn't go out in the city without sunglasses, or serious glasses. <laughs> Still, you wouldn't want to walk the streets, where the asphalt is boiling anyway. You could literally fry eggs on the curb. Of course, by this time, all life on Earth has long since disappeared. But it's not just because of the temperature. Sirius emits enormous amounts of radiation. Our atmosphere serves as a shield against the sun. But in the case of Sirius, that shield wouldn't be enough. Now, why don't we take a more bizarre approach and make ourselves a double star system. These are two stars that revolve around a common center. And there's our Earth, safe and sound. 
It's all about the size and brightness of the stars. These two aren't too big, and they give off as much light as our sun. All that matters to us is that our planet is in the safe zone of the double star system. At sunrise, you first see one star appear from below the horizon, and then, a couple of minutes later, the other. The only problem is that this beauty may soon explode with enormous force. In binary systems, one star is always heavier than its companion. Sooner or later, it starts pulling matter away from the smaller star. Gradually, the bigger star just eats its neighbor. Then the big brother can reach a critical mass and explode. This explosion would be about as strong as a supernova. It would destroy our entire solar system. The light from this explosion would be visible for hundreds of light years away. And after that, there would be a huge nebula in the place of our star system. It's stardust and particles that are left from our world. Going to the realm of the crazy now, a black hole. Yes, there's one at the center of our solar system now. We know black holes are scary, mysterious objects that pull in everything in their path. But even around a black hole, there is a habitable zone. You just have to be far enough away so that it doesn't drag you down into its black abyss. Mercury and Venus would be too close to the black hole. So most likely, they'd be torn apart and then head for the event horizon. This is the last stop before hitting the singularity, the heart of the black hole. There are only two problems, light and time. A black hole pulls light in instead of emitting it, so the Earth will quickly become dark and cold. And time goes slower around heavy objects. Near a black hole, one second can be equal to weeks or even months away in outer space. We won't feel this difference, but the entire universe around us will develop faster relative to us. Any object can become a black hole if it's compressed to a certain size. For example, the sun can become one if it's shrunk to a width of 3.7 miles. And even the Earth, if you squeeze it to a width of 0.7 inches, it becomes a black hole. Oh. Now there's some little rock lurking in the center of our solar system. It's a neutron star. It's about 18 miles wide. Some meteorites are much bigger than that. But it has a mass comparable to the Sun. So its gravitational force is about the same, and our planet's orbit is intact. But the problem is that neutron stars emit next to no visible light. So it's now permanent night on Earth. Still, it gets very hot here. When a neutron star is born, it can be several times hotter than the sun at first, but it quickly cools down to the temperature we're used to. So there's a chance that all life on Earth hasn't yet been scorched. Another problem is that these little guys are rapidly spinning and can become pulsars. It's kind of like a powerful spotlight on two sides of a spinning star. Neutron stars also eject radiation at tremendous speeds. These rays will make our planet literally sterile. No life form would be able to exist under these conditions. And now, it's time for the biggest star ever known, Stevenson 218. This red giant is 2,150 times larger than the Sun. And if we place it at the center of our solar system, its edge will lie on Saturn's orbit. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter are already swallowed by the huge star. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are roasting like chestnuts on a fire and will soon evaporate. In fact, this could happen to our sun as well. The older it gets, the redder and bigger it becomes. It'll eventually run out of its fuel, hydrogen, and the sun will start to burn heavier elements in its core. This will cause it to expand. Then we'll see more beautiful sunsets and sunrises, but the temperature will become too high. In theory, the sun will get so big that it'll swallow the Earth. And then, it'll explode in a supernova, leaving nothing of our entire solar system behind. Shiny. Imagine a being so powerful it can suck in entire galaxies, so mysterious it's invisible to the naked eye, and so impressive it bends the very fabric of space and time to its will. Yes, meet my mother. Nah, yeah, just kidding. Actually, meet the ultimate superhero of the universe, the black hole star. What is it, and how does it work? Well, let's find out. 
The universe is full of marvels, and the black hole star is one of the most impressive ones. It's a supermassive force that can bend the laws of physics and a true enigma for scientists to unravel. No wonder science fiction writers find them so captivating. A black hole star, also known as a quasi-star, is a hypothetical type of extremely massive and luminous star that may have existed early in the history of the galaxy. They're predicted to be as luminous as a small galaxy. But unlike modern stars, they weren't powered by nuclear fusion in their cores. A quasi-star's energy would come from material falling into a black hole at its core. And yes, just like a normal black hole, these stars have the power to suck in anything and everything that gets too close, including stars, dust, and even entire galaxies. But how is it possible that the star is born from a black hole? And what's more, how do they continue to coexist together? Well, first let's discuss how black holes are born in general. It all starts with a supermassive star, one that is at least a few times more massive than our own sun. This giant of a star burns bright and hot, shining with the light of a million suns. But eventually, it runs out of fuel and its fate is sealed. As its lifespan comes to an end, it makes one final massive boom. A blast so powerful, it can outshine an entire galaxy. This blast is called supernova. During this boom, the outer layers of the star fly away, while the core gets squished together by its own gravity. If the squished core is heavy enough, it can keep squishing until it becomes a black hole. And just like that, a black hole is born. Don't even try to put diapers on this thing. Now, this cosmic monster baby can continue to grow by swallowing up anything that comes too close, including stars, dust, and even entire galaxies. This is basically what's happening now in our universe with supermassive stars. But what about quasi-stars? The formation of a quasi-star could only happen early in the development of the universe, before hydrogen and helium were contaminated by heavier elements. And because of that, quasi-stars have one important feature. They are gigantic, so enormous, that it's literally impossible to imagine. They may have been dwarfing even the largest known modern stars, like VY Canis Majoris and Stevenson 218. No wonder they're so scary. They were born from protostars, one of the first stars in the universe. The great-great-grandfathers of, you know, everything. So now, imagine a protostar so massive that its core collapses into a black hole, just like we described before. But the key difference is that in a regular supernova, the outer layers of the star are blown away by the energy released during the boom. Meanwhile, in a quasi-star, these outer layers are massive enough to absorb the energy without being blown away. What do we get in the end? A star with a black hole in its core that weighs from 1,000 to 10,000 solar masses. This quasi-star is about 14,000 times bigger than our Sun, which makes them bigger than any star we know today. These celestial titans have some pretty crazy properties. Once a black hole is formed at the center of a giant protostar, it starts to give off a ton of energy. This energy helps to balance out the force of gravity, making it kind of a giant fusion-based star. They would be so bright that each one would look like a small galaxy. Quasi-stars would have a pretty short lifespan, around 7 million years. Just for comparison, our Sun is about 4.5 billion years old, and it's only halfway through its lifetime. But either way, during this short period, the black hole at the center would grow to be about 1,000 to 10,000 times the size of our Sun. Quasi-stars are also thought to be super hot, with temperatures reaching over 17,500 degrees. But as a quasi-star gets older, it starts to cool down, and its outer layers become see-through. Eventually, it cools down to a temperature of 6,740 degrees. And at that point, it's curtains for the quasi-star. It can't survive at that temperature. So it just dissipates, leaving behind an intermediate mass black hole. Unfortunately, right now, there's no observational evidence for the existence of quasi-stars. This is because they're thought to have only existed a very, very long time ago. They may have been very massive population 3 stars, which are extremely rare and difficult to detect. 
It's also very unlikely that any of them would still exist today because of their super short lifespan – only 7 million years. So why do scientists believe that quasi-stars could have existed? Because they're looking for ways to explain how supermassive black holes formed so early in the history of the universe. They're found at the center of most galaxies. But how could these monsters have formed so quickly? After all, it takes a really long time for small black holes to grow into supermassive ones. This is where the idea of quasi-stars come in. These stars aren't just destructive forces of nature. They're like the black belts in the martial art of gravity. They can bend and twist anything to its will. That's why these stars, if they really existed, had to play a crucial role in the evolution of galaxies. They must have been instrumental in shaping the universe as we know it. So those intermediate-sized black holes that they left behind could eventually turn into supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. But we're still yet to solve this cosmic mystery. Detection and study of black hole stars is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Only instead of a needle, it's an invisible and mysterious object. And instead of a haystack, it's the vast expanse of space. But with the help of some pretty cool technology and a lot of brain power, scientists are getting closer to uncovering the secrets of these celestial giants. Here are some things that can help us in this research. First of all, gravitational waves. They're like ripples in the fabric of space-time, caused by the movement of massive objects. Albert Einstein predicted them way back in the 20th century, but they were finally detected only in 2015. We caught them by observing the collision of two black holes. This discovery confirmed that black holes can merge and that they're a powerful source of gravitational waves. Scientists think that by studying these waves, they can learn more about how black holes form and grow. We can also try to detect quasi-stars by observing the effects of their gravity on nearby objects. It's like trying to spot a criminal by their fingerprints. For example, if a black hole is located near a star, scientists can observe the star's light being distorted as it's pulled toward the black hole. And, of course, we can use our technologies, such as X-ray, infrared, and radio telescopes. This allows us to study black holes in various ways and at different stages of their lives. In other words, scientists are working hard to uncover the secrets of these celestial giants. We develop new telescopes, search for primordial black holes, and try to understand the connection between black hole stars and dark matter. And we're making some pretty incredible discoveries, just like with gravitational waves. All these things will bring us closer to uncovering the secrets of quasi-stars. And when we find out the truth about them, it will become a new page in our scientific history. Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years, to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom, if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century, but modern studies of Eta Carini estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our Sun. Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carine releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way, Eta Carine is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carini is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carini experienced a nova-like explosion. It increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, 
Eta Carinae was the second brightest visible star after Sirius, the dog star. And Sirius is only about 8 light years away. Since 1863, aside from a couple of flare-ups, Eta Carinae has dimmed back down to its original brightness at magnitude 4.5. Now astronomers owe us a small apology, which we don't expect to get anytime soon, for star magnitude nomenclature. The brighter a star is, or planet, or moon, the lower its magnitude. Thus, stars brighter than first magnitude are either zero magnitude or negative magnitude. The full moon, for example, is magnitude negative 13. A magnitude positive 4.5 star, like Eta Carinae, is quite dim as seen from Earth. But it's clearly visible in a night sky without light pollution or clouds if you live anywhere south of the latitude of Cairo, Egypt. 30 degrees north latitude is the farthest north you can see this star. Now, listen up. Eta Carinae is currently up to something. It's been brightening again and is now brighter than at any time since 1864. It's a complex situation. Eta Carinae is really two stars. Eta Carinae A and Eta Carinae, hmm, what's your guess? Oh, B. There's a third star nearby that's also interacting with the double star's dynamics. Now, without looking, I'm guessing it's named Eta Carinae C. Good guess. Blown out into two incredibly massive globes of gas that are expanding at 20 million miles per hour, Eta Carinae is, without a doubt, one of the strangest looking stars you'll ever see. Remember, it's located at a great distance of 7,500 light years away from us. And if anything had happened to Eta Carinae in the last 7,500 years, like going hypernova, we wouldn't be able to see it. Because none of Eta Carinae's electromagnetic radiation would have gotten here yet. Astronomers are keeping a close watch on Eta Carinae because it can go hypernova at any time. Or maybe it already did 5,000 years ago. In which case, we'd only have to wait another 2,500 years to see it. Yeah, like I'll put it in my planner. Now, from a list of over 30 likely candidate stars that might go supernova, Rho Cassiopeiae is many astronomers' choice. Another Greek letter, Rho, is the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. It means that Rho Cassiopeiae is the star with the 17th brightest apparent magnitude in the constellation Cassiopeia. Yet Rho Cass, a nickname, is only one of seven known yellow hypergiant stars in the Milky Way. It's another whopper. To be seen at magnitude 4.5 from a distance of about 10,000 light years away, Rho Cass must be a very large star, a hypergiant. Placed where the Sun is, Rho Cass would encompass the orbit of Mars. But it's still yellow. It's not a red giant star. Red indicates a cooler surface temperature. Rho Cass, as huge as it is, is still as hot on its surface as our Sun, or even a little hotter. That can only mean two things. Deep inside its core, Rho Cass is fusing atoms much heavier than hydrogen or helium. Plus, Rho Cass is producing much more energy than a red giant star. In the year 2000, Rho Cass erupted massively. It brightened by two orders of magnitude as it ejected 10,000 times the mass of Earth into space at four times the speed of sound. Astronomers detected the signature of titanium oxide in this eruption. This means that Rho Cass is much closer to going supernova, or in this particular case, hypernova, than astronomers used to assume. Iron is just a few steps above titanium in the periodic table, and when iron forms, fusion stops and a star collapses. Rho Cass is really close, or more correctly, was really close. Because the eruption we saw in the year 2000 really happened 10,000 years before, many astronomers think Rho Cass has already gone hypernova, formed a black hole, and doesn't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse caught everyone's attention not so long ago. The star, not the movie. It dimmed dramatically, appearing only 37% as bright as it usually is. Is it getting ready to go supernova? Betelgeuse is by far the brightest star in the whole sky, in infrared light. This is an important fact because it relates to Betelgeuse's status as a supernova candidate, as we shall soon see. Betelgeuse is also named Alpha Orionis, another Greek letter designation. So we should conclude that Betelgeuse is the brightest star in Orion, right? Wrong. It's the second brightest star in its constellation. Rigel, or Beta Orionis, is the brightest one in that region. Yeah, figure that one out. 
It may be because Betelgeuse is classified as a semi-regular variable star, which sounds kind of redundant to me. Its approximately 400-day cycle of pulsation changes its brightness by about one full magnitude, going from much brighter than a first magnitude star to closer to a second magnitude star. But never was Betelgeuse observed to dim so rapidly or so drastically as it did recently. So what's going on with it? Well, from late 2019 to mid-2020, Betelgeuse went through a period of substantial dimming during a mass ejection event. The world astronomy community jumped on the situation, and in the course of their investigations, they came up with some surprising new factual data on Betelgeuse. First, Betelgeuse is not as far away as we once thought. The new, more accurate distance for Betelgeuse is 548 light years. That's 25% closer than previously measured. The second new fact, Betelgeuse's diameter has been reduced by the same percentage. The star is now known to be 25% smaller than previously believed. The cause of Betelgeuse's dramatic dimming was also determined. The giant star ejected a cloud of gas that contained magnesium. The cloud blocked a large portion of the light coming from Betelgeuse and made it appear visually much dimmer than it really was. Magnesium is not halfway to iron on the periodic table which means Betelgeuse is not as far along on the path to a supernova as was suspected previously. When iron starts forming in a star, it means that this star is close to shutting down its fusion reactions. The next step is implosion. We aren't quite there yet with Betelgeuse. This star emits most of its energy as infrared light, and it also indicates that its core is most probably still burning helium, and not something that would greatly increase the amount of heat, like carbon for instance. Betelgeuse will still go supernova, but not for another 100,000 years. So you can cross it off your supernova list for the time being. And as for how to correctly pronounce Betelgeuse, you can say it any way you like. There are as many different pronunciations out there as there are people who think they know how to pronounce it correctly. Now, Supernova 1987A caught astronomers off guard when it lit up the large Magellanic Cloud 100,000 plus light years away from the Milky Way. That's when attention was turned to a similar star much closer to Earth, Rigel, in the constellation of Orion. Could Rigel surprise us and suddenly go supernova? There's something called the supernova problem that you should, you know, probably know about because it may relate to Rigel going supernova or not. It seems that stars over 17 solar masses don't always go supernova. Recently, a red giant star simply vanished. Once again, it didn't go supernova, it disappeared. This had often been happening in computer simulations of supernova, and now it finally occurred in real life. Rigel's mass is 21 solar masses. In other words, it's 21 times more massive than our Sun. So, will Rigel go supernova or simply vanish into a black hole that it'll create in its core? Astronomers and physicists continue their work of learning more about the dynamics of massive stars, scouring the sky for the next supernova in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, we can rest confident that we on Earth are in no danger from the harmful effects of nearby supernova explosions. We live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, stellar neighborhood. Except for those Martians next door. <laughs>